Hi, I'm Brian and I work with the Tennessee Department of Education. I was a science teacher for a long time and now I help your science teachers. So today we are going to talk about matter. Now, matter is a word that kind of just means stuff. Everything that you can feel or see and even things that you can't see like gas are different types of matter. Now, in order to figure out what something is, like for example, the sun, how do we know what type of stuff is the sun is made of? We have to know different things about matter. So we're gonna start doing in this activity today, and this is activity page 1.1, .1, is we're gonna start looking at matter and see if we can identify a property of matters. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you about some things that are not properties of matter, because this can be a little bit confusing. So the key thing about a property of matter is you might be able to measure something, but just because you can measure it doesn't make it a property of matter. So let me give you an example. Some people will say you can use a thermometer and the thermometer will tell you how hot or cold something is. So since I can measure temperature, that must be a property of matter. That's not exactly the right idea. A property of matter has to be something that can't change. So my temperature might be hotter or colder. Or if I have some water, it might start out as ice, which has one temperature. And then that water might melt and be a liquid that has another temperature. And it might even turn to gas. So it's always water. But since temperature can change, we wouldn't think of temperature as a property of matter. So we're only going to focus today on things that are properties of matter that don't ever change. Okay, so let's talk about a first one together and we'll make some observations together. So normally we would have stations when we were doing this activity. We're not going to have stations exactly. I'm just going to work through it with you. So I don't have beakers at my house. So we're going to improvise. Instead of beakers, I have plastic cups. So here is a plastic cup and here is a second plastic cup. And then I have two different types of matter. One of them is a rock that I got out of my backyard. The other one is a sugar cube. A sugar cube is just sugar that's been pressed together into the shape of a cube. So I'm going to put each of these into one of these cups. So the rock and the sugar cube. Now, there is a property of matter that's called solubility, and that's a big fancy word. And all solubility means is able to be dissolved. And so I'm going to pour some water here into each of my plastic cups. Now I have water with a rock, and I have water with the sugar cube. So maybe you've made different powdered drinks. And when you made a powdered drink, something like Kool-Aid or something like that, you know that sugar dissolves. And if you look closely at the picture here, you can actually see that this sugar is dissolving. It's breaking apart. It's starting to crumble down to the bottom of the glass. Now, that is a property of sugar. Sugar dissolves in water. So you might be thinking, well, yeah, I know sugar dissolves in water, but sugar dissolves in everything. I've seen sugar dissolve in water my whole life. But just to show you another example of a property of matter, I'm gonna move these two out of the way. So I have my rock that doesn't dissolve and I have my sugar that does dissolve. That's that property of solubility. Now I have two cups, both with water in them, or both with sugar in them. This time, I'm gonna fill it with water, just like last time. But this other beaker, I'm gonna fill with something different this time. This time I'm filling it with something called isopropyl alcohol. 
And you'll see when I pour this, isopropyl alcohol looks a lot like water. Let's see. It's clear like water. It's a liquid like water. So you might say, well, I know what happens. I've seen sugar dissolve before, and the sugar is going to dissolve again this time. And we can see that the sugar on the left is crumbling apart and dissolving. If we look at our sugar on the right, it's not really doing the same thing. So when we talk about solubility, when we talk about whether or not something dissolves, it matters what we're dissolving it into. So just because something dissolves in water doesn't mean it dissolves in everything. We've sit, let that sugar cube sit there long enough. I think based on our last ones, we know that if it was going to dissolve, it would have dissolved by now. And so we'll just set that one out of the way. And if someone reminds me, Cam, can you remind me later? If someone reminds me, we'll check back in on that sugar cube just to make sure that it didn't dissolve during the video. So properties of matter are useful really for two different things, and it depends on what your job is. If you're a scientist, properties of matter help you figure out what something is made of. If you're an engineer, though, you might use properties of matter for something different. If you're an engineer, you might use properties of matter in order to choose the best material to complete a job. So if I wanted to make a sweet drink, and that sweet drink is made of water, well, I know sugar will dissolve in water. Sugar has a sweet taste. So sugar is something good there. There are other things that might seem sweet, but don't dissolve in water, and they wouldn't make a good powdery drink. So keep that in mind. There's two different things. There's properties of matter that we use to identify, and there's properties of matter that we use for engineering. So let's look at our worksheet here. On our worksheet, it says, what are the objects? Well, we know that both beakers have water in them. So I'm going to write down water there. Beaker one had a rock in it, and beaker two had a sugar cube in it. Details and description, what did we see? Well, we saw that the rock stayed the same, and the sugar broke apart. That's another way of saying dissolved. When something breaks apart, when you put it into a liquid, that's called dissolving. Now, what scientific questions will you ask about these examples of matter? Hmm. So the worksheet gives us this question. Why do some things dissolve in water and others do not? That's a really hard question. I would have a hard time explaining that. I think we can do a little bit better than that question. If we wanted to understand it, maybe we could ask questions that will help us think of patterns. So maybe I can ask a different question like, what other things dissolve in water? Asking what other things dissolve in water is a good science question, because then I could say, how would I figure that out? Well, I could do an investigation and I could try to come up with different things that dissolve in water. If I were an engineer, I might even ask different types of questions. I would want to say, if I'm going to build a structure, how can I make sure that my structure doesn't go away in water. That would be important. Okay, so that's station one. Station two, let's take a look here. Station two deals with something that you've probably seen before. 
a balloon. I have a balloon that's filled up with gas, and I have a balloon that's not filled up with gas. If I look at these two, let's kind of compare the objects. What can I see? Well, I can see that the filled balloon, oh, what are my two objects? I guess that's the first thing I'm supposed to say. So I have a filled balloon, and I have an empty balloon. And what can I say about these two things? Well, one is larger. They're both bendy. That seems like a good science word, bendy. I can move them around. They're both stretchy. I can press on it and it stretches out. And maybe all these things are because this balloon is flexible. It can change shapes. So, what scientific questions can we ask about these? Well, maybe let's think like an engineer. What might I use a balloon for? Oh, maybe I can use a balloon hmm, to have a party. And I want to have lots of decorations. And I want so many decorations that all these balloons are just going to fall out of the sky. So I'm going to fill a bag with balloons. So I want to be able to build, blow these balloons up as big as I possibly can. Well, something I would need to know is how stretchy are my balloons that's an investigation i could look into and i could learn more about different balloons i wonder if all balloons are the same amount of stretchy or do some balloons stretch more than others and when would i want a balloon that stretches more oh cam do you like water balloons yeah my boy likes water balloons if we had a really stretchy water balloon, we could fill it up with so much water. That would be a good balloon. So we want to think about different questions depending on what we want the balloon to do. All right, station three. Station three, I have two different containers. Oh, I, I can see what's going on with this one already. It's kind of hard to see. Maybe if I hold this closer, it'll focus. Eh, you might be able to see there's ice in each of these. When I hold these two in my hand, they feel different. One of these feels really cold. So let's see. What are my notes here? My objects. I have a metal cup. And I have a foam cup. Observations. Well, this, these observations were based on my touch. Now, we have to be careful. Sometimes some of our senses are better to use than others. Scientists do not want to use taste unless that's their job. Like a scientist who maybe is trying to make a type of sweetener, they might have to use taste, but that comes a long way afterwards. That's not the first thing they do because tasting things can be really dangerous. Smelling things is also really dangerous because we don't know if some of the smells might hurt us. So we have to be really careful about the way we use our senses. So details and descriptions, what can I feel here? Well, I can feel that the metal is cold and I can feel that the foam is not cold actually if I hold the foam for a while I can even feel that 
after a while, the foam starts to feel like it warms up. So those are some observations that I have there. Now, what are some questions I could ask with these properties of matter? Well, let's try to think, when would it matter if something got really cold? Maybe, when do I want something to be cold? Oh, I've seen people use metal for cups that we drink out of not like this cup but like metal water bottles so maybe a scientific question that i would want to ask here is what material makes a better cold cup that's hard to read. What material makes a better cold cup? That's a question. Because this foam sure doesn't get very cold. But this metal gets real cold. I bet that metal might make a good cold cup if we wanted cold drinks. You should check that out. Now, other questions. I wonder if all metals work the same way. This is a stainless steel, so lots of iron in this cup. I wonder if this cup was made of aluminum or if this cup was made of copper. Would it work the same way? Do all those metals feel the same amount of cold? Hmm. So those are properties of matter. Now, they have kind of fancy names for each of these properties. We talked on our first station about dissolving. And we said the fancy name for that a scientist gives, and it's not important to memorize this name. You'll learn it more later on. A scientist calls the property of matter solubility. So if we want to say, does something dissolve? We can say, is this soluble? Or what is the solubility of this material? With our balloons that were stretchy and flexible, that property is flexibility. And this is a big word. This idea of some things feel colder than others is called thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity. So if something has a lot of thermal conductivity, it's going to change temperature really easily. I can feel this cup. I can feel it making me colder. <clears throat> if something has low thermal conductivity, it doesn't seem to change temperature. In fact, this cup actually seems to feel warmer if I hold it longer. So when we think about properties of matter, we're not talking about temperature. We're not talking about mass because, again, the temperature of this cup might change depending on what I put inside of it. This might feel like a really cold cup if I put cold water in it, but it feel like a really hot cup if I filled it with boiling water. So temperature is not one. We're also not talking about things like mass. Mass is not a property of a material because mass would change. If I cut this cup in half, then the mass of this material would change. But this material's solubility would never change. Even if I cut the cup in half, it still wouldn't dissolve in water. Its flexibility wouldn't really change. If I cut it in half, it would still be about as flexible as it is right now. And if I cut it in half, its thermal conductivity wouldn't change either. So we're going to look tomorrow at three more stations, stations four, five, and six, and see if we can't come up with some other physical properties of material, things that don't change. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Take care. Oh, oh, I almost forgot. Thank you for reminding me. What did I need?
Oh, I needed my sugar cube. Here's my sugar cube and water. Here's, excuse me, that's my sugar cube and alcohol. There's my sugar cube and water. Now, you can see that the sugar cube that's in the alcohol, the one on this side, it's still there. Now, it started to break down a little bit. You might say, oh, Mr. Kane, I don't trust you. This is breaking down. Well, it's because this is not pure isopropyl alcohol. There's water in here. And we know that water dissolves sugar cubes. So the little bit of water is making it go away. This one is just pure water. We can see how much of a difference there has been in those two. All right. I will see you tomorrow. All right. We've made a claim. And our claim is that engineers use physical properties to help them design objects. So we're going to look at some common objects today. And let's start with these common objects, which are, this one's probably hard to see. This is a cast iron pan that I use just about every morning for breakfast. And I'm going to turn it on to a high heat. The second pan that I use sometimes for breakfast is an egg poacher. And this makes eggs one way, and that's by boiling some water. And I'm also going to turn it on to high heat. Now the difference between these two is when I use this cast iron pan, I want it to heat up nice and evenly. When I use this aluminum pan, I don't really care how it heats up because I'm, all I'm doing with the bottom part is boiling water. I'm not actually trying to cook anything with it. So this isn't a perfect experiment, but what I want to show you here is how the temperatures change with these two. So they're both set to high. Again, not a perfect experiment. If I were an engineer and I wanted something to conduct heat quickly so that I could boil water quickly, then I would go with aluminum. And even in this short amount of time, let's see if my thermometer works for this job. My temperature is already off the charts, meaning I've gone above, this is a body temperature, so I've gone above 100 degrees. They both went off the charts. So I heated both of those up so that they are off the charts, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let them cool down. And I'm going to see which of these two is the first one, because when you, can first one to cool down, because Part of thermal conductivity is warming up, and another part of thermal conductivity is not just how well you absorb heat, but how well you lose that heat that you've already absorbed. Cast iron pan, still high. The aluminum is now down to 109.3. So I heated them up for similar amounts of time, but what I can see the cast iron pan is still too hot. Aluminum pan is already down to 102. Cast iron pan is still too high, meaning it's higher than what my thermometer can read. Aluminum keeps dropping. Aluminum's down to 99.7. So what I'm seeing here with thermal conductivity is if I want something that absorbs heat quickly or loses heat quickly, in other words, it's a quick conductor of heat, then I can go with aluminum. If I want something that's going to hold heat, then I can go with cast iron. For my last example, I wanted to find something where we had one job and we used different materials for different parts of that job. And this will make sense in a second, I hope. So I went out to a, a water hose and the job that a water hose does is it brings water someplace. So you'll notice that there are two different materials here. I use this white pipe right up against the post, but then I use another pipe for the garden hose. And so there are two different materials here because each part of the system has a different function. For the garden hose, it needs to be able to be pulled across the yard. It needs to be able to wrap around different parts of the trees or bushes. 
and it needs to be somewhat lightweight. So it needs to be a pretty flexible material and flexibility is good there. For this riser, I used a different material because here I didn't want it to be flexible. I wanted it to be durable. So I know that this is gonna get bumped into where it comes out of the ground. And so I wanted to be sure that it was something that was gonna last a long time. And so I used something that's still a little bit flexible because I don't want it to crack, but it doesn't need to be as flexible as the garden hose. So here, the same physical property, flexibility, you might want different things at different times. I hope this helps you think about the way that engineers use physical properties and the benefits of thinking about physical properties when you're designing something.